is up, guys, and welcome to another episode of Guadagni Vision, the first ever podcast dedicated to Paraguayan football in English. As always, I'm Roberto Rojas, and joining me as always are my two great co-hosts, Federico Perez and Ralph Hanna. And guys, you know, heading into this international break, we would think it would be very quiet in the country. There's nothing really going on. You know, obviously, Paraguay are out of the World Cup. So it was all time to just, like, focus on the football and see what's going on, see some new faces. And boy, did that take a backseat to everything that's happened over the week in Paraguay. I mean, this is obviously getting away from football in a bit, but we're seeing Megan Fox and, and Machine Gun Kelly at the Costanera, at a, at a bar in Asuncion. We see him performing uh, outside of a hotel because of Asuncion Ico not uh, happening due to a rainstorm. We see Miley Cyrus also le- landing in, in, in Paraguay as well and wasn't able to go to the concert because of lightning striking her private plane. We see uh, a lot of animals on the, on the was it an emu or one of those animals on, on the streets of Paraguay, an alligator as well. And then we saw a, a little cat get a bit uh, in a fight with uh, some Paraguayans, uh, maybe even myself as well. And that contributed to perhaps her retirement from, from music. I don't know. It's, it's been weird, but uh, it's basically Doja Cat uh, becoming maybe the, the Judas guy, the, 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 um, the traditional, I guess you could say, sacrificial lamb that they use every year in Paraguay as a tradition for San Juan. Uh, I think we have our, our nominee, uh, guys. But uh, excluding all that, obviously, there's football going on. We have, obviously, the World Cup qualifiers in place. Uh, we saw the game against Ecuador yesterday. We are recording literally 24 hours since their win against uh, Ecuador, the 3-1 win over the NCAA Leste, and a couple of days bef- uh, before the game against Peru in Lima to close out qualification for Qatar 2022. And the Copa Libertadores and Suomini Cana draw was announced today. We saw our Paraguayan teams come about, and boy, do we have a special group to talk about. What is that group? We'll get to that in a bit. But first, let's go to someone that I I can imagine is trying to digest everything that's been going on in the last week in in Paraguay, Fed. I mean, how are you hanging up there? Because I'm just trying to catch up, and even though I'm thousands of miles away, it's it's difficult, really. That was a weird introduction. I don't know how you did it, Roberto, but you explained like the whole craziness of this week here in Paraguay. I, I don't know if people actually follow that much news about Paraguay like you do. You're pretty far away. I know Ralph also reads pretty much every section because that's what you've just done. You went to the you went to the shows. You talked about music. You, you talked about the festival that was supposed to happen but didn't happen because of the rain. Yeah, the, the rain was an issue this week for almost everything that you wanted to do, a couple of, of, of events, football events also were canceled due to that situation. But yeah, your attention was there on social media as I'm listening to you, Roberto, following your introduction, especially with that Dodger Cat drama. I was not waiting for, I was not waiting on that from you and not from Dodger Cat either. And so that that's actually even hit TMZ. I can't believe all the bounce you got there on social media. Claps to you, my friend. I'm happy for you. But here we talk about the football. Here we talk about the the, the Paraguayan football. And we have a lot to talk about in that sense because we've just seen the Albi Roja win. Finally, finally, this team gave us three points that are meaningless, but three points after everything that happened in these last seven games, we were able to score also. And early in the game, we have an injured player that's not, the, that's also the bad news actually uh, coming out of this Ecuador uh, game. They were not waiting for that out of us. And we showed a couple of new players and it was nice to see these guys really show up to the, to the challenge, you know? Um, this is what we were waiting for them, character and showing the garra that, that Maria always says, you know, showing our, our, our claws and just, the spirit that people are used to seeing out of the, out of Paraguay, you know, the identity. I think people felt close to the Paraguayan team that played yesterday against Ecuador. But we'll get into depth of that. We'll talk about almost all the players. I want to hear Ralph's also uh, uh, what he feels about this Paraguayan team after this game. And we going up against Peru, you know, Peru, they're going to feel the pressure there. Uh, just like Ecuador, you know, Ecuador ended up um, – celebrating in Ciudad del Este, even though they lost to us. But uh, the same thing could happen even with Peru. Uh, hopefully it's not that e- we don't make it easy for them. And we see a couple of more players still uh, on this game that's coming up. 
and Libertadores Sudamericana. We got so much to talk about in this brand new episode. All right, Roberto, let's get right to Ralph. Yeah, let me jump in. The one you missed, look, I can link football to the craziness. You had Mia Khalifa posing naked on the same balcony that I didn't know you follow me Ralph. oh okay right. every well i i don't personally but it's been in every whatsapp group we're doing this week uh but she yeah she was on the same balcony that ronaldinho was in when he was on house arrest in paraguay about well it must have been about two years ago so there you go i linked it to football at least some of this craziness but yeah on the pitch let's go on to the pitch i mean uh paraguay was They've never lost to Ecuador. In fact, they've always beaten Ecuador at home. So there was some kind of pressure, even though nothing to play for. It's like, don't be the team that keeps breaking the bad records you don't want to break, which a lot of this generation have done. But they didn't. They held true and they beat Ecuador again. And it was, yeah, it was an inspiring performance. And we got some of the, well, we hoped we got some of the young players to actually uh, hit, take the field, make debuts. We got... Um, we got this kind of attacking football that we just hadn't really seen from Paraguay. I mean, we scored three goals against Peru in the Copa America, but you have to go back uh, five years for the last time that Paraguay scored three goals in a World Cup qualifier. So that was, it was quite nice just to see something happening, a bit of excitement, things to talk about other than what was going wrong and what are the mistakes. Now we started to see some of those positives. So that was, that was great from, Uh, from Paraguay in Ciudad del Este to, to, really, to really start thinking as we do for the cycle, which is going to be for 2026, because that's the next big, big target now. Yeah, absolutely. I think everyone is very much, you would say, in a positive vibe, you would say, because, you know, despite them being out of the World Cup, the fact that we did see some of those young players show up and show up well, uh, demonstrated that we'll go straight into it because you know Paraguay did come into this game like Ralph said with history on itself that you know they had never lost a World Cup qualifier at home against Ecuador they changed grounds for the third time in this qualification they started off in the defense order at Jaco for the first few games before moving to La Nueva Oya in their loss against Uruguay and now heading to Ciudad Leste where we did see a couple fans actually show up you know it was actually a a crowd full of people it, it wasn't a sell it obviously at the Antonio Aranda but you did see a, a lot of support there and you know obviously you could start off with that first goal from uh for Paraguay essentially from the two starters the two young players and the two players that I think are are going to be the the flag bearers of this new generation and that's Julio Enciso and Robert Morales and Enciso obviously the leader of that player picking the ball from midfield and you know obviously playing that pass to Morales for him to score inside the first 10 minutes on his debut. The first time that a player has done that uh, in a World Cup qualifier since Richard Ortiz against Uruguay in 2011. So it's, and who obviously took the pitch that day as well. So talk about deja vu for, for these players. And, you know, unfortunately the luck for Morales did not last long as he had to leave the game uh, due to an injury. And it was confirmed today that he had torn ligaments and ACL meaning that he will be out for a significant amount of time, definitely out of the year for Seto Guardano, a big loss for them. But nevertheless, uh, the, goal, the goals kept, kept on coming uh, in the second half. Uh, right before the end of the first half, we actually saw Pedro Incapié score an own goal uh, to give Paraguay a 2-0 lead. And then in the 54th minute, the player that a lot of people have criticized, that a lot of people were waiting for him to show up, Showed up in maybe the most useless game there is, but Miguel Miron scoring uh, in the in the game to give all the three points for Paraguay, keeping them in eighth place at the at the time of recording. In fact, they cannot move any further from that because of Chile, Peru, and Colombia being ahead of them and having the difference in points. So Paraguay will stay in eighth place at the most if they get the result against Peru. But I want to go to Fede on this one first because, you know, it's been such a frustrating campaign for, for Paraguay throughout this entire process. We've done episodes since the beginning. We were hopeful for this generation of Paraguay sides. And we see two players that I think demonstrated that kind of gara that we needed. And it was the players that many people never thought that would be a part of the side early on. But 
you know, the fact that these are these are two youngsters, obviously Morales, 23, and Ciso, who I thought was the man of the match in that entire game at 18 years old, just putting on a show against an Ecuador side that just made the World Cup. It's a demonstration that, you know, I think Guillermo Barros Queloto has talent to build with. And I mean, there is something there. And we've said that for quite some time, but it's going to be interesting to see what else comes about from this Paraguay side. So I just want your thoughts on what you saw from Paraguay and, and you know, I guess a positive, like you said, getting a, a win in a qualifier for the first time in, in quite some time. Fresh air, that's what I saw, you know, from those two kids. Um, they wanted to play this this game, and they showed up to it. Uh, I mean, for Paraguay, yeah, it was three points that were nothing, like I said in the introduction. But for these players, it was their first time. It was their chance to be a starter in their national team in front of the home crowd, even though it wasn't Ciudad Leste, the atmosphere was different. If they would have played in Asuncion, it would have probably been – empty wherever they played it if they played in Defensores de Chaco if they would have played in in the Olla uh, Azulgrana again of Cerro Porteño I, I think nobody would have probably gone they would have given a lot of tickets out again like they've done with these last couple of games to have people in the in the stands and it hasn't been easy because this team hasn't showed uh, pretty much anything lately you, you, they weren't getting shots let's, let's remind people of that as Berizzo left this team uh, it was at the lo their lowest point, you know, the, the, this team was having no offense whatsoever. And then uh, Guillermo Barros Esteloto kind of came in and didn't change much. We said it before, uh, kind of kept the same players, even the, the same style of playing, which was actually what surprised me because if everything wasn't working up to then, why would you keep doing the same thing? And that's what I saw against Uruguay in, in our last real chance to get back in this fight to try to get to the World Cup. That was the important game. And maybe even before against Chile, but Uruguay was the last chance we really had in front of our home crowd. That was the last game we played here in, in, in Paraguay. And the, the players were just cold, cold blooded in, in that game. I mean, they didn't show anything. They were heartless. And in this game against Ecuador, it was just a totally different sense of the team. You had Richard Ortiz being the heart of the team, an experienced player uh, picked up by, by Guillermo Stiloto. Maybe a lot of people were shocked and surprised to see this name on the list. But hey, he showed up and he really had a great game again uh, uh, alongside Andres Cubas, who also kind of surprised me by his level, the, the, the amount of balls that he took away from that midfield of Ecuador. They couldn't play. And, you know, it was raining and it was hard for them to get uh, acquainted with the field. I'm talking about the Ecuadorians. And, and then we, we, we put the pressure on them right away, right away. And those first minutes were key to put the game on our side and put the pressure on them. They needed to go to the World Cup. We were showing new players uh, and our players really wanted to, to be at this game. That's the first sense I got of the match in those first minutes, Ross. What did what, what you think of those of that first half, especially? Yeah, I think the, the really interesting thing, there were, there were two points I saw. One, Richard Ortiz, like you mentioned, what he brought to the team was that they started to, to push a bit higher. They were just, he, he just managed the line to make sure they were pressuring Ecuador a bit higher and they were winning the ball because of his capacity to win the ball and, and Cubas. But what we've seen before is maybe Cubas would, would usually be a bit further deeper and, and then not as effective to launch attacks. And then the other thing I saw was Julio and Ciso, his ability to kind of drop, link up, start running at players really helped Almiron because Almiron had been doing a lot of that work and, and not doing it very well. But now you had somebody else who was kind of doing more of the running at people. And if you end up looking at the stats, you'll see Julio and Ciso by far was the player that, that took on the most dribbles. And I think Almiron has like a very low number, like, like one or two, which for him is really low. But it's because he didn't need that pressure. He had, he had in Sisa doing that. And it was very effective. As we saw, of course, in that first goal that we're talking about, and Sisa links up really well with, uh, with Morales, uh, with Almiron, with Morales. And then he gives it in Sisa, manages to give the pass to Morales, who always has that great movement of the ball and made no mistake to finish. And that's all within 10 minutes. But by then, Paraguay had been testing. Morales actually got injured on the fourth minute, so well before that. And it was chasing down a ball, him and Hincapié. And he got in behind. Again, his movement was causing problems to 
Ecuador. And again, Paraguay had won the ball quite high up. So I think one of the, that was one of the key things I just saw was a bit more aggression from Paraguay in in the press and playing a slightly higher line in terms of in terms of the midfield press. And that's I, I really think is on Richard Ortiz. I think he was the person like organizing that. And then you just had this this Julio and Ciso taking off a lot of the burden from uh, from Almiron in terms of who's going to be the ball carrier in this team. And it it really it really did work. And then the second goal we should just talk about in terms of how it came about. The Inca Pien goal is is crazy. But at that point in time. The rain was torrential. It was, I mean, I think the game probably should have been paused at least for 10, 15 minutes because it was this crazy torrential rainstorm that came through. You could hardly see. I was watching on TV. I could hardly see the players because the rain yeah, was the, so but, heavy. But the, ball, but the ball was never an issue, Rob. The ball was always moving. I mean, they did a great job in that stadium because before it was terrible. I mean, if, if we had a rain like that, I mean, we, you had to suspend it and play it another day. Huh? You, you know that stadium. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That That's one thing to point out. The, the pitch was really good and it held up through that. Um, but I think, I guess what happened with Inca is he's just totally misjudged the speed of the pitch with all that rain. Maybe the goalkeeper's visibility isn't as good and then that second one goes in and that takes all the pressure off Paraguay going into that second half. But, but Hey, it was the Albiroca that did it in that first half. We're talking about with that extra aggression, they picked up something like three yellow cards in that first half. And I think six overall, they committed over 20,000, the whole game Paraguay. This is, that's kind of the old Paraguay you're looking at that extra aggression and, and really breaking up play and not letting uh, Ecuador get at any point into their kind of free flowing style, which which is the game was very similar to the to the one in Quito. If you remember that Quito game was it was very tight and Paraguay were quite good defensively for about 60 minutes, 70 minutes, and then threw it away. But what they did miss out in that game was was the breaking up the play. I remember I think it's Gonzalo Plata who just ran through the defense and no one stopped him, and that brought around the first goal. So at least they're learning their lesson a little bit with this kind of uh, this kind of tactics and aggression. And the, again, I'm saying his name again. Richard Ortiz was was very important in all of that. Absolutely. They were never they were never better than us, Roberto. Either in Quito or here. So it was like it was hard. It was hard for us to see that that team was going to the World Cup and we weren't going to the World Cup and we were beating them 2-0 almost easily. They weren't doing much in that first half and. I think we were all happy to see what we saw from Paraguay straight away from the, from the game, especially with Julio Ciso and Morales, even though I didn't like a couple of things. You know, we, we lost Morales way too early in the game. It would have been a lot better to see a lot more from him with Julio Ciso. And, and, and the only player I think thumbs down in this 11 that we saw against Ecuador is Blas Rivero, you know, he, he kind of messed it up. His, he messed up his own game and he really had a, he was probably the only bad player on the pitch. The other 10 were doing a great job. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and part of the reason of that frustration, I think on Rivero is because this is a player that I think a lot of the fans were asking for after the poor performances at left back from Santiago Arzamendia. He comes in and he makes this rash challenge and now we're back at square one. So we have to see what happens there. Obviously the replacement actually comes in to Ivan Torres. We'll send a shout out to him because after everything that he had been gone through over the course of the year, you know, obviously losing his wife in that really bad uh, shooting at the, uh, at the Jaumina festival. And, you know, I think all the adversity he'd been through, I mean, for him to go back on the national team was very much a, a demonstration of obviously his, his performances at Olympia, but also the courage to, to go back. So, yeah, it's, it, I think overall you could say it's positive again, you know, you can't really say anything else besides that. Um, besides that, maybe this Ecuador side isn't as good as we think it is. Maybe it's a, a, still a talented side with a lot of players. I'm curious to see what they do in Qatar, but yeah, it, it's interesting when you think about it, how this side, we couldn't get any results in Quito when you think about it, Repetit. Yeah, it's true, but you know, I, I got that sense playing uh, uh, other teams also. I mean, I think Colombia wasn't that much better than us either when we played against them, and I could say the same thing on, about other teams, and they're going to the World Cup, and we're not going to the World Cup. And you know, Uruguay, Uruguay, got, Uruguay yeah, Uruguay, Uruguay as well. Yeah, I was going to mention them. They got on a small streak. They beat us, and 
even Chile, I mean, they brought a, they they won a couple of games. That Argentina, if it wasn't, even Argentina, if it, Argentina. If it was if it wasn't for Chile losing uh, on this last game, I mean, they they had the, their chance also. I mean, it was a crazy qualifiers. Let's be honest about that. I mean, it was really hard to to know who was gonna be who, and and we we had a lot of surprises also. And Paraguay had many 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 chances to get back in it, and it's unfortunate to see it now. And that was the main thing for me in those first minutes watching those guys play like that putting their hearts out and and I was thinking why didn't we see this against Uruguay you know I, I, unfortunately I was crying that out uh, but you know we got to look forward we got to look to the future and we saw some of that future uh, I think with Julio Ciso and Morales especially absolutely even the game against Argentina where you know they weren't able to win in any of the games at home and away that still is a bit of a of a somber taste but Nevertheless, uh, we have to move on. And moving on, of course, is a game against Peru. A lot of factors going into this one, obviously, guys, because, you know, despite the fact that Paraguay are out of the World Cup, we do have the opportunity to spoil the party for Peru and give some hope to Colombia and Chile. So there are a few factors going into this game, guys, and I will explain it uh, thoroughly. But obviously, Paraguay go into this game with some history. You know, the fact that, you know, you mentioned, Ralph, uh, Paraguay went to the game against Ecuador, never losing to Ecuador in a home World Cup qualifier. The same cannot be the same. The, the, the case cannot be said for Peru as Paraguay have never beaten Peru in a World Cup qualifier in Peru. So a lot of things are going into place. But nevertheless, here are some of the scenarios. If Peru is able to defeat Paraguay in this game. They will qualify for the Intercontinental Playoff regardless of what happens against Colombia and Chile. If they draw or they lose, they have to hope that Colombia doesn't win against Venezuela and that Chile also doesn't win against Uruguay. Having said that, if indeed Paraguay do get the results needed, um, that means that Paraguay are really playing for house money because if Paraguay do indeed defeat um, Peru and Colombia get their result against Venezuela that puts Colombia in fifth place and the same thing for Chile they have to hope that Peru and Colombia doesn't win and they have to beat Uruguay so that puts them into the fifth place spot so a lot of things are really going into place and now we are the ones that kind of are deciding the fate of three national teams um, but regardless of all that obviously heading into this game there will be some really key absences obviously you mentioned the absence of Robert Morales due to injury and Blas Riveros due to a red card. There will be also no Gustavo Gomez in this game, no Miguel Miron, uh, no Matias Villasanti. So five slow, uh, five um, losses for this game. So but if, I, mean, I don't want to come out there. So what, what do you want to see from this Paraguay side now? And who do you feel is the one that should go in? I didn't want to see these guys already in that game against Ecuador. I mean, Gustavo Gomez, I didn't want to see Miguel Miron. I mean, I think they already had their game time. I mean, they need to leave the spotlight for other players, especially when we have Jesus Medina on the squad. We haven't seen him yet. But maybe he should get a starting role there. Oscar Romero, you know, he's he's fresh off of Boca. He's, he's starting to play there. He he might get a, a, an opportunity also. He, he He's usually a sub also for Miguel Miron. Uh, thinking of what uh, Steloto might do for this game against Peru. And then, you know, back there, Junior Alonso is going to come back. He was absent for this first game. Uh, Junior Alonso is very important in, 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 the, in the starting position, especially if he's going to play with Balbuena, who I think had a, a, a really good game. Every, every time you see Balbuena in there, I, I think he performs uh, pretty well. And we have Omar Alderete also. You might see him in starting back there in the defense. I mean, you could change it up around a lot, actually. Uh, I would like to see more players. I would like to see more formulas. Uh, Villa Santi, uh, I don't like him coming in this game against Ecuador. He, he wasn't putting in good passes, making the difference. I mean, you want to see him make a bigger impact in the game when he comes in. And you want to see him grow on his game also. And I haven't seen that uh, from him lately. I actually think that he's kind of losing his spot in the national team. I, I kind of get that sense also with some players, just because Teloto already has about four or five games with these guys. And he's not only uh, knowing what they can bring to the team, he's also kind of putting that filter and just seeing this guy, you know, he had his chance, 
let's pass, let's move on, let's try another one. He's kind of doing that, you know. Uh, he, he's testing players out. He's looking to the future. He, they have about six, seven friendlies that are going to be played in this 2022. Paraguay is not going to waste their time, apparently. But like we said in previous episode, we don't really know what's going to happen with Staloto uh, as the manager of this team, just because of what could happen in the FA at the beginning of next year. Uh, and he needs to show something. So it was very important also for the coaching staff to win a game and to do it in this fashion, you know, in, in a certain point of the game, we were winning 3-0 and surprising South America, I would say. Yeah, and what he needs to do is start to put his mark on this team with new players that weren't used during Berisa and players that, that basically failed in the mission of going to the World Cup. So, I mean, some of the changes that we, we actually got a preview of in the Ecuador game. So Angel Romero came in for Morales, and I think he will probably end up starting Angel. But And then we saw it was the interesting change was it was Josue Colman came on for Julio and Ciso. So I wonder if Josue Colman actually ends up taking the Almiron spot and playing in that game against Peru from the start, which could be quite interesting. Uh, and then, the, yeah, the, the players I'm thinking at the back is, is in, does he end up playing Ivan Torres just so he can play with a proper left back? Because I don't think he wants to throw in a Omal or, or a Junior Alonso at left back. That's something that Berriso did a lot, playing the centre backs uh, at full back. It was a very defensive and negative tactic, and maybe he doesn't want to do that, especially with uh, Peru have similar injury problems. So Carrillo also, I think he tore ligaments or, or, or some kind of, some kind of long-term injury. So he's not playing. And he was the player that really tormented Paraguay down the right-hand side. If we remember in that, in that first game, in the home game. So with that in mind, maybe we can be a bit more attacking and to the point of we've never won in Lima or well, at least not against Peru in a World Cup qualifier. Now's the time to try and make some good history for Paraguay because we've been breaking all the records we didn't want to throughout this, this campaign or the last two campaigns of losing to teams like we lost to Venezuela at home for the first time in 2018 and all that kind of stuff or 2014. I can't remember when it was, but yeah, let's, let's do something in exciting for a change and let's break a record we haven't, we haven't seen. So the, the real thing as well is also for Paraguay to match Peru with the with the intensity and the aggression. So in this game against Ecuador, Paraguay definitely were the more intense and aggressive team. But there was a point that Ecuador they knew even with defeat they could end up qualifying, which is which is what happened. Peru, no, they they can't afford to mess around. Like they have they're going into this with their lives on the line. So hopefully Paraguay can even be matching that. As they, as they technically aren't playing for anything. But that's what we want to see is to build on that win from, from Ecuador. And, it, and I'm going back to it, but that Ecuador game, a lot of it was that, that aggression and intensity that had just been lacking for a long period during that whole kind of seven game run of not even scoring a goal. We just, our confidence was kind of ebbing away. And now we've managed to charge it up a bit. So let's keep that going in Peru. Yeah, definitely, guys. I think it's it's really the the way of saying, hey, we have nothing to lose. I mean, this is it's, this is a side that I think obviously is pinpointing to the future. I think you know, like so your NC, so your Alerit is, you know, your your Kuas is all those type of guys are, are going out there really to to stamp their authority to say, hey, this is the team that I want to play for, and this is the the position and the role that I want to be in. So go for it and you know i hope that happens i i don't think it will and I'm, obviously peru have a good side that they are able to perhaps get a result needed but hey history is there to be broken guys so let's see what happens i did see something different in this match guys uh, and i'm talking about you know just the way we handled the ball i mean with Perizo, there was a lot more uh we got to touch the ball we, we, if if we got to take care of the ball. We, we had we have to have more possession, and it was all about possession. And it, it, it kind of got to the players, and they we never had possession, you know. And we tried to change the style. And in this game against Ecuador, we saw a very direct football. We saw long long shots from defense to forwards. 
And Richard Ortiz was very important also on that, on those long balls. Uh, you know, the pressure up there was important, but I, I think we saw a team that didn't really want to handle the, the ball that much, but that actually wanted to take it away from the, the other team and wanted to be aggressive. Uh, and, you know, and I think that was key, you know, just for Baros Choloto to understand how the players can actually uh, uh, get a better sense of his idea and him getting closer also to, to what the, what he can get out of his players. I mean, I think, you know, that was, that was the main thing I got out of this game against Ecuador, that he's understanding what he has and the players are kind of getting it too. Hopefully we, we do this again against Peru. We start winning two, we start winning three. We, we, we have players that are scoring, not just Morales because Morales is going to be out for a long time. So now we need a new striker, maybe Seba Ferreira, we need our midfielders also to, to give us goals, but we need to build something. And it was very important for this first win. We, we got to start with one win. <laughs> do, do, do you feel as if, though, and I, I want you guys to just give me a name, but if you had to pinpoint one name to really lead this Paraguay side, not even for the game against Peru, but just in general, who is it? To lead the squad. To, to be, be the captain? main guy. To be the main guy. No, oh. to be the main guy to move forward because – if you're going based on age. I'm not giving my hopes up on, on Almiron, just picking the guys from, from this squad and who, who, who I think will move, move forward with uh, Stelotto especially. I, I think Almiron is going to be one of those guys that he's still going to be a star in this team. He's still going to be very useful. He's still going to be very used by Guillermo Stelotto. And... and I would point him out, and I'm also waiting more from Ankel Romero. I think he was probably one of the stars in this team at a certain point in the qualifiers, and I think he could get to that point, uh, to that level again. And then we got to look at the young, the younger guys. We don't know where they, where they're going to be at the time the next World Cup is gets here. Hopefully, they they keep building up, but these guys are going to leave Ralph. They, they need to go to Europe. They need to make a new career out of themselves, and they need to make it out there so they can bring it to the national team. Yeah, and if you're really thinking about who's the player going forward, because I think Roberto's point is it can't be Richard Ortiz, I guess, as well. But And then you have like all the hope on people like Enciso, who's who's definitely the most exciting talent but historically what paraguay that what they need is somebody it's got to be somebody in the middle it's the midfield that's been such an issue so then you start thinking i mean is it's gonna is it gonna be someone like marcos gomez at olympia or is it hugo quintana also at olympia that these are learning from ortiz at the moment and coming through we don't know because they're only 20 you have hugo martinez actually at, at libertad i think he's injured at the moment but is it one of those people we're going to have to end up seeing? Because that's where we've, we've suffered so much. And to Fede's point about how they're playing, it's, he's right. It's, it's not really like a very intricate system. It's, it's a very kind of direct and easy system, which is also what uh, they're doing at Olympia at the moment under Julio Cesar Cáceres. So I do think there's one of those guys like Marco Gomez and Hugo Quintana, who we didn't see against Ecuador, but... But looking ahead, we'll probably end up seeing players like them in, in the future that could lead Paraguay. So, but let's see. Yeah, long way to go. Definitely a long way to go. Um, yeah, I mean, I think closing it off here, it's obviously going to be interesting. But let's hope that these guys can prove something. I mean, again, we had nothing to lose against Ecuador. Obviously, history was there. But let's, uh, let's enjoy this last one. And let's hope that they can close off. And actually... Pressure's no, on them. Pressure's on them. Exactly. Well, also, we haven't won a final World Cup qualifier in quite some time. So maybe that's also history to be broken as well. Um, so let's hope for the case. And let's hope that Paraguay could indeed close off Qatar 2022 on a high. Now, switching gears to what's going on in the club game, the big news that happened today was the draw of the Copa Libertadores and the Copa Sudamericana. The group stage will begin in the next few weeks, and we see uh, five Paraguayan representatives in both competitions. We'll start off in the Sudamericana, actually, because we see the two Teams that, you know, hard to believe, guys. These two teams were in the second division, I think, three years ago, something along those lines. And now they're playing in South America's second premier competition, the Copa Sudamericana, 
I'm talking about Guarenia and the team that we talked about for quite some time and the new the new Bucks in General Caballero of Juan Leon Mallorquin looking at the group that they're in uh, for both these sides, Guarenia are in a really tough group. They got Internacional, a, a, a reigning, not a reigning, but a, you know, a, a top team historically in South America, winning competitions like the Libertadores and the Sudamericana. We also have Independiente de Medellín, a, a top team who have always been consistent in competitions in the Libertadores and the Sudamericana. And Nueva de Octubre, uh, another side that has started to rejuvenate itself um, from Ecuador. So you know, real quick, guys, I mean, with one team qualifying from this group, I think it's all Guarenia's chance to just gain experience and see what they can build from. I mean, I don't, unless you guys are going to say anything otherwise, uh, I think this is this is going to be pretty straightforward, don't you think? Yeah, it's, it's very tough. It, we saw this last year as well. I mean, I remember Dosa de Octubre did very well in terms of taking points off teams, but they weren't really good enough to win games. They, they were good at at getting kind of draws and and I think they did get get one one win from what I can remember but it's it's very difficult the way the Sudamericana is currently set up for teams from smaller um, from smaller countries to get through because you've got you've got to finish first in a group with a usually a Brazilian or an Argentinian team so I'm sure I mean great for Guarenia that they get to they they get a bit of a money spinner with Internacional. If they're, if they're intelligent about it, they can take the game to see that less thing because Guarenia's Via Rica is actually pretty much the middle distance between Asuncion and Ciudad del Este. They can take it there, get a lot of Brazilian fans over into the stadium and, and make lots of money. So let's, let's hope they can, they can do that. But in terms of getting out of that group, it's, oof, no, it's, it's really difficult. And, and uh, yeah, the, t- the tougher draw for them than for General Caballero, who I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about now. Yeah, and actually, I want to go to Fede on that one. Uh, you know, I wanted to take turns on that because looking at General Caballero, Juan Mayor Mario Quin, they are in a tough group as well, headed by Independiente of Argentina, Deportivo La Guaira of Venezuela, and Serra of Brazil. A bit more of a tasty group, you would say. I think a bit more like open. It. It's, it's a good group. And, and come on, I think when you're in the second division just a year ago, now taking on the most successful Copa Libertadores champion of all time. Uh, yeah, again, scanning experience and seeing what you can get. And, and also, hey, a money gain as well, getting some money. Yeah, Guarenia, yeah, for them, it's their second time around. For General Caballero, it's their first time. And it's different because they're coming from the second division. And it's kind of a prize for them because of what happened last year due to the pandemic. They had to put one of the spots for Sudamericana in that team that was champion from the second uh, lower division. Uh, and and that was General Caballero from Juan Leon Mallorquin. They advanced from uh, after after fighting uh, after uh, after going up against another pair wine team, and now they they're gonna go around the continent showing their stuff around. And uh, you know it's 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 important for these guys to just just to be out there and show themselves. Maybe we have a couple of players standing out in the in the in, in the competition. I, I think that's the best thing that we can hope uh, out of these two teams. And, you know, maybe General Caballero can get in a run. They actually surprised a lot of people, scoring a lot of goals in that second game. Uh, unfortunately, we don't, they don't know if they're going to have their stadium available. We do know that Guaidenia isn't going to have their stadium available uh, to play the Sudamericana. So just like Ralph said, unfortunately, the, what I've heard so far is that they're not going to be able to use Ciudad del Este. They're going to have to play in Defensores de Chaco, which is really far away from their base ground in Villarrica, so uh, it's going to be really tough for their fan base to come to Asuncion for pretty much every game, and General Caballero is going to try to open up their stadium to have their home ground available. They are yet to play a home game as of yet in the Paraguayan League, Roberto. Absolutely. I think it's uh, definitely uncharted territory for General Caballero Juan, Mayor, Juan Leo Mayoquin. So we'll see what happens. And now switching gears to the Copa Libertadores, the three Paraguayan sides, Cerro Porteño, Olimpia, and Libertad, representing Paraguay in this one. We'll get to the one that mind blown in a bit, but let's talk about the group that Libertad is in because they are actually in a favorable group. Looking at the favorable group itself, they take on uh, in a group with Caracas of Venezuela, the strongest of Bolivia, and Atlético Paranaense of the reigning Copa Sudamericana champion. So 
interesting group, guys. Interesting group. But looking at Libertad, looking at the team that they have, you would think that they would have enough. I mean, yes, it's always tough to play in Brazil, get results there, you know, taking on as well. I'll go to you on this one first because playing against Bolivia in the altitude as well. But yeah, given the consistency of Libertad in this competition, they have enough what it takes to get out of the group. I feel positive. I like this one. I know you do also, Roberto. You know, you were doubting yourself there, but I love this group for Libertad, actually. I think they could build something in this, and they really need to do that. And they're fighting the, the, the Apertura also against Cerro Porteño, so they're going to be distracted now in these two competitions. I want to see how they handle it. I want to see how Garnero starts mixing players around because that's something that he definitely doesn't like to do. He's pretty much used the same players ever since the local league started. So I, I want to see Libertad in Libertadores, and especially uh, as the second part of the year comes around, what Libertad is going to bring to this squad also, because Libertad is the team with the money. Libertad is the team that's bringing the stars in lately. And I think they want to go in big in this Libertadores this year. Yeah, and Libertad, actually, you mentioned uh, the altitude, but Libertad had performed really well in, in La Paz and Cochabamba. They've been to Bolivia for the last, not the, not last year, but the three previous years. And I was just having a quick look. They beat uh, Wilsterman in Cochabamba. They beat the strongest one year in La Paz and drew with them the other year. So they, they actually do okay for whatever reason, and that's, and I'm looking at recent years because this is with a lot of these players are, are still around. So I think that gives them a bit of the advantage in Venezuela against Caracas. I think they will feel they, they have enough. And then they've, they've, they've dodged a bullet in terms of they are playing a, a Brazilian side, but in that pot one, you could have got Palmeiras, you could have got Boca, River, uh, you could have got Flamengo. So they, they dodged a bullet in terms of not getting one of those real real big giants and Paranaense as well for, for those that, that uh, don't know our geography as well. I mean, it's in Curitiba. It's not that far from, from Paraguay as well. So it's, uh, it's maybe a shorter trip, an easier trip. And it's a team that, that I think they will feel they can certainly take points off here at, here in Paraguay in, in Asuncion. <clears throat> so I think Libertad are, are looking good. The big thing is, yeah, that for them is what they end up doing in the, in the knockouts and will they be without Julio and Ciso? Because by then he might be in the Premier League, who knows, right? Or Atalanta, we're looking at him apparently with the latest reports. So they'll be missing, they're likely to miss him for that second second round. But then they still have Roque Santa Cruz, they still have Taquara, they still have Tito Villalba. So they've got such a strong squad there. Um, they, can, they can make a dent in this competition, I think. Absolutely. And obviously looking at the big group that everyone's talking about in Paraguay uh, to really cap off a chaotic week of what's going on in the country outside of football. Boy, I mean, talk about a clash of titans, a group that has Colón, Peñarol, Cerro Porteño and Olimpia. The Super Clásico is heading into the group stage of the Copa Libertadores for the first time in quite some time, actually. Uh, you know, beforehand, Ralph was actually giving some stats on this about how the format was different that you saw Paraguayan teams take on each other in the group stage. The artists. But in this new format, it hasn't been done and we see it now here. I mean, Fede, go to you on this one. I mean, talk about easing off a, I mean, the, the pressure is on for both these two teams. I mean, really, realistically, if both these teams were in a different group, they would have had enough to potentially get out of it. And now with both of them included and putting in a Peñarol side and Colón, it's open for anyone, not just for the, the Uruguayan sides and the Argentina sides, but also for both Cerro Bordeño and Olimpia. I mean, where do you even begin with this one? Yeah, ever since Olimpia qualified to the group stage, everybody was like, hey, it could happen. It could be possible. It's... There's we said much. it. We even said it. We even said it. In the, yeah, we even well. said it here. I mean, it wasn't that big of an opportunity, but it happened. You know, it's a draw, and they ended up in the same, uh, in in the same group, and with very strong teams actually, Peñarol and Colón. I mean, I think they're gonna put up a fight also in this group. I think it's gonna be really tough for everybody here, not for, just for Cerro Porteño and Olimpia that have to go at it right away in the first game, and then they're going to face each other in the last game. 
So talk about suspense, talk about everything that could happen in between. Uh, well, everybody's going to uh, obviously love having more Super Classicos this year just because it's just a, such a big event. A lot of people like to go to these games. It, it draws so much attention before, during, after. So it, it's beautiful to have more Super Classicos. I'm actually loving just how, what Olympia is bringing with Julio Cáceres right now. You, you also know what to expect from Cerro Porteño's Chiqui, with Chiqui Arce's work there. And unfortunately, they do have this bad news of Robert Morales. They are, are going to miss their key player, probably their most important, the, the guy that, that's scoring all the goals. They're going to need, uh, they're going to need more, uh, obviously more out of other players now. And I want to see how this Cerro Porteño bounces back from this. You know, Morales was just way too important lately. And they're going to miss they're going to miss him. Football's going to miss him, actually. And uh, Olympia's building up. And Olympia is, is going to try to get in, in the local league again to try to fight it till the end. And meanwhile, they're going to go up several, time, uh, several times against uh, Cerro Porteño with, this, with the sense that they are always better with, at them in, in Libertadores. You know, that, that's the historical thing, that uh, Olympia has always been the, the best team in Libertadores against Cerro Porteño, and they have to show it now in, in this 2022 going up against this team twice. E even though Olympia is not going to have their home ground, they're going to probably play in Defensores de Chaco uh, during the Libertadores, and Cerro Porteño is probably going to take them to their to their Olla Azulgrana. But I'm looking forward to it, Rob. This is going to be fantastic. Yeah, so when it came out the draw, you're like, wow, like, there was a small chance it could happen and, and we got it. And it's, I mean, it's such a good group. Otherwise as well, just quickly, I mean, Colón, they come back to La Nueva Oya where they played the 2019 Copa Sudamericana final. So that's going to be brilliant. Peñarol is obviously a huge club. They're coming in. Uh, it's interesting what you said, Fede, about uh, Olimpia are better than Cerro in Libertadores. It's true, head to head, they've won 11 games. Uh, Cerro have won nine games, there's been 12 draws. Olympia, of course, has won three Copa Libertadores titles, which is, I guess, ultimately what counts. But interestingly, they've been drawn in groups together 13 times before. The last time was 1999. And in 10 of those occasions, Cerro have finished ahead of Olympia in the group, which is quite surprising. And there's only one time that Olympia ever got through the group stage and Cerro didn't, which was 1994. So we, there's quite a few uh, examples of when Cerro and Olympia finished like third and fourth because they were with Brazilian teams, Argentinian teams, and they, they couldn't do enough. But there's quite a few times when Cerro managed to get through and Olympia didn't. So, hey, this is, this is something to look out for. There is one time I also found 1974, when Cerro, Olimpia, and Peñarol were all in the same group. Peñarol won that group, Cerro second, Olimpia third. So let's just check history doesn't repeat itself. That wouldn't be good for El Decano fans. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be great. It, these games are great. And especially Libertadores, it, it brings something else. So usually the Clásico can't be played at nighttime. The, the police don't like it to be played at night because of you know uh, possible dangers, that kind of, th that kind of thing the Libertadores has to be played at night. So you're going to get that amazing atmosphere. You're going to get the the, the TV. It's, I'm sure uh, the broadcasters are going to pick this as their, their main game the, when it's whenever it's going to be played, when it be the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they're still deciding. And that last game that Fede mentions, the, the last game of the, of the group is going to be the classical. It's the first and the last. So that's going to be it. Wow. I'm, I'm sure at that point, I would be very surprised if at that point, both teams have, have had their future decided. So it's going to be a massive match. Definitely a very massive match for both these two sides. And I'm absolutely excited about it. I cannot wait to begin. And hey, it all kicks off with that game. Set up with Daniel taking on Olympia at uh, obviously whatever Olympia's home ground will be, but it gets started right there from the get-go guys. And it finishes off as well. So talk about how Potentially, we could see a group being set up like that, and it could finish it off like that as well between these two teams. So I'm excited about it. I cannot wait. We're going to definitely talk about it in full in the future episodes of Guarani Vision as we close it off here on another great episode talking about all things uh, in Paraguay, even putting in some pop culture references as well. So 
Thanks again for everyone for listening in and tuning in as always. For myself, Roberto Rojas, Fede Perez, and Ralph Hanna, thank you so much for listening in. See you soon.